Hello, this is Barbara McNichol, and I've been an uh, editor of nonfiction books since 1996. I'm the creative word tripper tips, which I'll tell you more about a bit later. And I invite you to visit, visit my website, barbaramcnichol.com, to learn a whole lot more about me. But this is about you, so let's get started. Here's our agenda today for this webinar. Whack wordiness. What the heck is that? We're going to find out. Setting your objectives. This is before you write word one on anything you're working on. Pursue a parallel path. This is a writing tip that authors can use day in and day out. Tap into the power of three. Next is punctuate and proofread with fresh eyes. We're doing a bit of a review on punctuation, but also some tips on how to be very careful with your proofreading. And then match the word to the meaning. So let's get started on whack wordiness. You know, a number of years ago when I was in the corporate world, my CEO made sure everyone in the corporate communications department had a copy of the book Elements of style by Strunk and White. I believe that book is still around. It came out in the 30s and it's still being revised. But if you look in the book, you'll see a definition for word clutter. And it's this, the leeches that infest the ponds of prose, sucking the blood out of words. Oh my gosh, you do not be accused of having clutter in, in your writing, that's for sure. So, the question becomes what to do about it. Well, we whack wordiness. We whack extraneous phrases that creep into our writing. For example, it's all about the fact of the matter is. We might say the fact of the matter is that it's unwise to go out carousing. Better, it's unwise to go out carousing. The next one, is intended to, is designed to, is meant to. For example, he gives a workshop that is designed to teach social media skills. Better, he gives a workshop that teaches social media skills. More direct, we're whacking wordiness, taking out some words that just aren't needed. How often do you start a sentence with there is or there will be? There will be many entrepreneurs who plan to author a book. Better, many entrepreneurs plan to author a book. Again, we kind of reach for something that's um, just right there. There is and there will be is the beginning of a sentence, and we honestly don't need that. Be more direct. Adding to that is a phrase in regard to. In regard to, uh, here's an example. Um, In regard to your industry, look up the right websites. Do we need regard to in that uh, situation? Uh, no, we don't. We don't need it at all. In fact, a lot of people say in regards to, and we don't need the S. It's not correct. How about is going to? He is going to. He's going to. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for my notes here. He's he's going to uh, be a key contributor better. He will be a key contributor. Now, I could tell you as an editor, I am changing this phrase so often to something more direct. Uh, I know in the spoken word we say is going to a lot, and in dialogue we say that as well, but in Business writing in nonfiction books is going to is an extraneous phrase, and we can be more direct. How about in order to? Add keywords in order to describe the new position. Better, add keywords to describe the new position. In this case, do we need in order to? No, it doesn't advance the meaning at all. Here's my all-time favorite. The reason why is that when a simple because will suffice. Five words, one word. Five words, one word. 
guess what? We can whack wordiness just as simply as that. I also want to draw your attention to wobbly words. And these are words that just don't add much meaning to a sentence. Take a look at any of these words that you think that, that honestly don't add meaning to a sentence. They're overused, and you, maybe you are kind of lazy when we pick them out. For example, really. I think it's time to go. I really think it's time to go. We don't need the really to get the sentence meaning across. How about some? We rely on some long-standing methods. We rely on 12 long-standing methods. Let's take this opportunity to be specific and not vague. How about much? Twitter reaches a much larger crowd than, than radio. Is much doing much in that sentence? We don't need it. Twitter reaches a larger crowd than radio. How about very? what I consider the most overused word in the English language. Again, we get lazy and we grab it and we just put it in place when it, and it doesn't have a lot of meaning in a sentence. I challenge you to be more descriptive. Get ready to do a very good job. Get ready to do an extremely good job or something. Look up in the thesaurus. What can we use that's more descriptive than very? And that, find information that you can apply easily, find information you can apply easily. I would suggest that maybe eight times out of 10, that can be eliminated in writing. Now, let me, while we're on the subject of that, let me get on my soapbox a little bit. When you're talking about a human being, it's not accurate to use what you want to use, it's not accurate to use that, it's accurate to use who. So we wouldn't say the girl that plays the piano, we would say the girl who plays the piano. I know when I'm watching TV and the broadcasters are getting it wrong all the time, I'm correcting them, I'm shouting at them. But honestly, please know the difference. If we're talking about a human being, we don't want to dehumanize them. We want to use the word who instead of that. I love this quotation from Elmer Leonard, who said, I try to leave out the parts that people skip. And somebody in a workshop pointed out to me that we don't even need the that in this sentence. Touche, I try to leave out the parts people skip. That's what whack wordiness is all about. Now, suppose you have a situation where you have to write a description. Maybe it's a bio, maybe it's a description of your book, and you only have 50 words. You cannot do more than 50 words. Well, in addition to the extraneous phrases and wobbly words, what else can you take out so you get to the magic number of 50? Well, I would say to question what I call decide to verbs. These are verbs that creep into our writing a lot. I decide to make a cake. Question it. Is decide the more important verb there or is make the more important verb? I decide to make a cake. I make a cake. Same with the word start or begin. He starts to talk fast. Is it important that we know that he's starting? Probably not. Go for the gusto and say he talks fast or he, again, begins and starts, same thing. She tries to pick it up. Be careful with the real meaning of the word try here because try and try and try means that she doesn't succeed, correct? If I try to pick up a cup, it means I haven't succeeded in picking it up. I've only succeeded in trying at it. So this gets a little tricky. If you find yourself using the word try, guess what? Question it. Is that the important word in the sentence or is pick it up more salient to what you want to say? 
Also, I see an awful lot of authors begin a sentence with, I think, I feel, I believe. Here's my take on this. Because you are the author, your reader automatically knows that it's something that you think, feel, or believe. Unless you want to use these phrases for emphasis and you use them selectively, I suggest you skip those too. You don't need to start sentences with I think, feel, or believe. Uh, most of the time, it's assumed use them for emphasis only sparingly. How else can we whack wordiness? Well, look for opportunities to replace a phrase with a single word. For example, at this point in time becomes now. Five words become one. How cool is that? A great number of fans becomes many fans. Again, we've eliminated three words in that. In reference to the book, we can say about the book. So look for opportunities to shorten those phrases and substitute a one word, um, make a one word substitution. Two more examples here. We arrived ahead of schedule. We arrived early. During the time that we waited, while we waited. Look for opportunities to just whack wordiness a little bit more. Become your own editor. It's very helpful. Also, I'd like to recommend that you change noun phrases to verbs. When I talked about this among a group of authors, oh my gosh, the light bulbs went out. Went, went on, they didn't go out, the light bulbs went on because they could see many, many opportunities in their own writing to use this technique. So we have, the, the instruction here would be to change the phrase, the examination of, and use um, an active verb, examine. For example, we deal with the examination of facts every day. Better, we examine facts every day. Same meaning, but we've streamlined it. How about reach a decision? We reach a decision to go to the movie. We decide to go to the movie. Which is better, shorter, crisper? How about the reorganization of? The reorganization of, we can change that, revise it, and use organize as an active verb. And as you probably know, active verbs are stronger than passive verbs in most situations. In addition to ION noun phrases, let's look for the MENT noun phrases. Uh, examples are the judgment of, the judgment of, or we can change that to judge. The employment of becomes employ. The enjoyment of becomes enjoy. The enjoyment of my work is important to me. Enjoying my work is important to me. Do you see what we're doing here? We're whacking wordiness and making it stronger at the same time. Think of these extra words as layers of onion skin before you get to the usable part and peel them from your writing. This comes from Diana Bohr, who's the author of 47 books. I think she knows what she's talking about. Also, to whack wordiness, you want to be aware of repetition in your sentences and get rid of any words that are repeated. Here's an example. Following a new process, we followed the techniques in this book. What's happening here? We're using follow, follow very close together. I got to say, this creeps into the writing that I edit all the time. It's amazing. And I think it's because it's harder to catch it when we're looking at it on screen than when we say it out loud. So let's change it to following a new process. We adopted the techniques in the book. 
By saying the first sentence out loud, we catch the follow follow and we know to make the substitution to the word adopted. So let your ear be your editor and read out loud as much as you can. We also would like to revise long-winded sentences, especially in nonfiction and especially in business writing. Here's what happens when we've got a long-winded sentence. By the time people get to the end of reading that sentence, they've kind of forgotten where it started in the beginning, and they have to go back and reread the beginning. Not good. We want that message to flow sentence to sentence to sentence. So here's my rule of thumb, and it's about 21 words per sentence maximum. It's also a, about the number of words we reach when we run out of breath. So if you're saying a sentence, reading a sentence out loud, that's about where you run out of breath, have to take a new breath. Experiment with that, see if that's right. But that's what my experience is. So when it is greater than 21 words, what do you do? Well, you turn it into two sentences, making sure both are full sentences. You whack the extraneous words. You get rid of those wobbly words. You turn the noun phrases into active verbs. And you rework who clauses. Here's an example of what I mean. Dee Smith, who is our new manager in the department, just had surgery. Better. Dee Smith, our new department manager, just had surgery. So we reduced it from 13 words to nine words, and it's just a simpler, more direct statement. So look for the who clauses in your own writing and see if you can shorten them. Also, I recommend looking for which clauses. Here's an example. The report, which we finished, is on your desk. Better, we put the finished report on your desk. There it is, neat and tidy. And so is your sentence. It's neater and tidier because we are whacking wordiness here. I also recommend you avoid including pompous phrases. Um, some of these can come across as arrogant. I have to, I have to admit, in the written word, we do not have the advantage of the spoken word. We can use gestures, we can use smiles, we can use intonations, we can use body language, all sorts of ways to imply that we may be teasing or serious or whatever, but not so with the written word. And we've got some phrases that kind of get in the way. Here are a few examples saying not to mention. Well then why mention it? Or, if I may say so. Well, you're the author, of course you may say so. And that can come across a little pompous. In my humble opinion, again, without intonation, without body language, perhaps it can be misconstru misconstrued in writing. How about to tell the truth? Well, does that mean I haven't been telling the truth till now? That's the implication, and it goes without saying. If it goes without saying, then why are you saying it? You see the difficulty with some of these common phrases that get into our writing. And here's my all-time favorite. In other words, it's not exactly pompous or arrogant, but boy, it creeps into writing a lot. And for me, it's a red flag. I take a look at that and say, okay, the sentence that comes before that phrase is probably a mediocre sentence that's followed by another sentence that clarifies that first mediocre sentence. Wouldn't it be better to go back and combine the meaning of both sentences so your initial sentence is stronger and more clear and concise and correct? So make that a red flag for yourself. In other words, can you actually consolidate those two sentences and make it stronger as one? 
you may decide no, but try it. I think it makes our writing stronger. Now, here's an assignment that comes with whacking wordiness, and it's this. Dig out something that you've written and select the longest paragraph there. Then count the number of words in that paragraph, rewrite it, and recount them. Your goal would be to reduce the number of words by one third, by one third. So if you start off with 99 words, Pare it down, pare it down, pare it down till it's 66 words. That's your assignment, should you choose to do it. The whole overall goal of whacking wordiness is so you don't make your readers work too hard. Because what happens when they have to work hard to understand what you're saying? Well, they put it aside till later, and later never, never comes. So apply these whack wordiness techniques to help make your writing more concise and people will respond. Let's move on. Now, there are, are times when you chances are you're looking at your blank screen like an artist would look at a blank canvas. You just don't quite know where to start. Well, I have a planning tool for you that I think will help and I call it setting your objectives. Now take a look at this outline. Does it look familiar? It's from my old journalism days where we talk about the who, what, why, when, where, and how. But if you're working on a blog post or a flyer or an announcement or a description or whatever it is, even the chapter of a book, all of these things need to be in your mind and in your thoughts before you write word one. And it's very helpful to actually write them out in as much detail as possible when you do that. So what do I mean by who? Well, who is in your target audience? Who will read this? What do you know about them already? Perhaps even ask about what their pain is. Then the what? What is the message, the takeaway, even the call to action? What do you want the reader to do, think, believe, or remember as a result of reading your piece? Maybe it's something like attend in a meeting or consider a new point of view or review a proposal. Maybe it's something like refund your money. Perhaps you're writing a letter to a credit card company and there's a dispute there. You want some money back. So that would be the what, the takeaway, the call to action, refund my money. Then there's the why, the purpose, the benefits. Why do readers need this information? What's in it for them? Why should they care? Well, think about it this way. There are benefits to you, of course, but the, really you want to think about the benefits to the reader. If you want to refund your money, that's your benefit. But when you think about the point of view of the credit card company, they don't want to lose you as a client. They don't want to mar their reputation. So you might also include benefits to them, why they should do what you're asking them to do. Then perhaps there's some logistics involved, the when and the where, if it's a flyer to an event, for example. I know I received flyers in the email that didn't even include those details. Oh my gosh, what a missed opportunity. So what logistics need to be spelled out? And perhaps maybe the most important thing is the how. How do you want to come across? How do you want your reader to hear you? Polite, apologetic, excited, firm, demanding, laid back, urgent, in the case of the credit card company, you want to sound professional, but demanding and insistent. So I guarantee that if you spend time spelling out the details in this outline form of what you want to write, then when it comes time to write the first sentence, it will be more clear. You'll be able to write it faster. Your brain has already done a whole lot of work. And let's just assume that you've actually already written this. What can we do to test it? Well, I call this reverse engineering. 
have somebody, ideally in your target audience, read your message, and then ask that person to identify the who, what, why, when, where, and how. If it aligns exactly with what you intended, hooray. But if there's any doubt or question, if the benefits aren't all that clear to that person, guess what? That's good news because now you can go back and revise it and give those benefits more attention. So I suggest you use this technique. Well, in fact, you might jot down right now where you might use this technique, what kind of things you are writing that would help it, a proposal, a sensitive email alert to somebody you want to uh, impress, whatever. Write down some of your ideas right now where you could use this tool. And then let's move on. To strengthen your writing, I suggest that you don't let a mixed bag of parts of speech wiggle into your sentences. Here's an example. His attitude makes a difference in changing, succeeding, and when he wants to move on. What just happened there? We set up an expectation and then deviated from it. Changing, succeeding, and when he wants to move on. Oh my gosh, kind of a brain twister. Better, his attitude makes a difference in changing, succeeding, and moving on. Changing, succeeding, and moving on. We've used the same part of speech three times. It has rhythm and cadence. It just sounds better. So look out for opportunities to do that. Here's another example. I'm traveling to New York City to shop, to visit friends, and maybe attending a conference would be good too. So what happened? Again, we set up an expectation and then deviated from it. The brain went off in a whole new direction. That's not good. To pursue a parallel path, you want to do something like this. I'm traveling to New York City to shop, visit friends, and possibly attend a conference. Shop, visit, attend. Now we're walking a parallel path. It just feels better. Opportunities in your writing to do that. Now, that nicely seg segues into tapping into the power of three. Those examples created rhythm because they were in the power of three. And oh my gosh, we've learned about this since kindergarten. Stop, look, and listen. Hop, skip, and jump. We remember those phrases because of the power of three. How about in the musical world? Blood, sweat, and tears. Earth, wind, and fire. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Oops. It's a good thing Young dropped out because now we can say Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And it sounds better. It has the rhythm of three. How about in business? We see this used all the time. The slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle. Or for eBay, buy it, sell it, love it. My favorite is Jaguar, grace, space, pace. Those are taglines that are very effective in business and tap into the power of three, two. How about books? Eat, pray, love. Elizabeth Gilbert didn't write eat, pray, love, and travel around the world. No, she kept it simple. Eat, pray, love, and tapped into the power of three. There's a book I read recently called Deep, Dark, Down. It's about the Chilean miners who were caught underground for more than 60 days. And their story is fascinating that got turned into a movie called The 33. Anyway, even though the cover of the book isn't that attractive, I think the title is Deep Dark Down. It really says it powerfully. Also, I recommend you punctuate and proofread with fresh eyes. Now, when I was looking for a graphic to go with this, I didn't have to look very far. I edited this book by Heidi Seifkus with new eyes, and I love the cover design because her eyes are directed right to the title and 
it's, they're also directed right to my title about punctuating and proofreading with fresh eyes. So let's move to a punctuation quiz. Just a brief review of punctuation. I can tell you that um, we can't cover a whole lot about punctuation, but this will hit the highlights. And I do offer a three-page punctuation guide summary. Uh, if you want to email me at editor at barbaramcnichol.com, I will send you that guide. Anyway, a few principles I want to cover today that will stick in your brain when it comes to punctuation. And it's this. Before it's time for lunch, take care of the recently sent emails. We have to correct the punctuation in this. And here's what it looks like. Before it's time, we want an apostrophe in the it's because it's really a contraction. It means it is time, before it is time. Now, this is rather logical, but my gosh, what a frequent mistake it is. People insert the apostrophe where it doesn't belong and don't insert it where it does belong. So pay attention to that. If you can say it is, then it definitely needs that apostrophe. Now, instead of the semicolon after lunch, like we had here, we want the comma. The reason for that is that what precedes the comma is a clause. It's not a full sentence. If it were a full sentence, then the semicolon would make sense. But it's not. It's a dependent clause on the main sentence. That's why we need a comma. And then recently sent emails, we don't need the hyphen. Now, there are a lot of Oh my gosh, there aren't very many rules around hyphens. You really do have to look it up individually to see if a combination needs a hyphen or not. However, there is one rule about LY words, like recently and independently and seriously. Those kinds of LY words never take a hyphen. I know you're going to see it wrong all over the place, but now you know the difference. No hyphen after LY words. Our second in the quiz. The building's interior was remodeled, however, the facade didn't change. Well, this needs help, correct? The building's interior, we do need the apostrophe after buildings because it shows possession. The interior belongs to the building. And in this case, we need the semicolon because what precedes it is a full sentence. The building's interior was remodeled. And what follows is also a full sentence. Yes, we could use a period instead of a semicolon. It's just that the semicolon shows there's a relationship between the first part and the second part. And the word however does take a comma. So that's the correct way to punctuate this sentence. Next one. The leader said, give it your best. You probably know this, but we do need a comma after said. And we want to use double quotes, not single quotes, in the American style of punctuation. Now, the Brits, the Canadians, Australians, they do it differently. Sometimes the punctuation is inside the, uh, outside the quote, not inside the quote. But the American style is to have that period inside the closing quote and to use double quotes, not single quotes. Just to expand on that a little bit, the punctuation for this, the author wrote the word darn. In this case, it also goes within the quotation mark in the US. This is the US style. So the quotation goes inside the quote, the period goes inside the quotation mark. Um, think about who your book is being marketed to. If it's being marketed in the US, yes, definitely you want to use the American style. But quite frankly, if it goes beyond the US market, the more the most accepted form internationally 
is the American style. I have some clients in Singapore and South Africa and Canada and the UK, and often they ask me, or I ask them, what style do you want? And they would say international style is best for us because we're marketing outside of our own country. So American style coincides with the international style. Let's move on to proofreading. Now, I've turned this again into a bit of a quiz. A tip for proofreading is to reread what you wrote at least how many times? Well, I would say a minimum of three times, but 10 or 20 times is great too. Maybe you need a thousand times. I don't know. But the point is that you don't want to send off anything that you haven't proofread and proofread multiple times. Um, I just find that there's so much carelessness and sloppiness. Uh, I even have a colleague who paid four proofreaders to read his manuscript. And my gosh, the glitches still got through. So yeah, it happens, but do your best to ensure that everything you send out has been proofread multiple times. Also, I recommend having at least how many other people read it? Well, two for sure, but three or 10 or 20 or more is also good. Uh, the point here is that you want to make sure you're closing the communication loop and having somebody else read what you've read. Did they understand what you put out there? That's the question. Also, you want to reread only after you've let it sit for how many minutes? Well, some people might say two to three minutes, but I say minimum 10 to 20 minutes, even 24 hours. And the reason is we do get in a hurry. We want to send something out quickly. We just don't quite take enough of a break when we read it, read it for the second and third time. So get up, get a glass of water, do something completely different, then come back after 10 to 20 minutes and reread it with fresh eyes. Also, I recommend you, you, Here's, I'll give it away here. You print it out and read the sentences out loud because, as I said, the ear is a good editor. Here's what I like to do. I will take time to print out something after I've worked it and worked it and worked it on screen, go into another room, put my feet up, maybe have a cup of coffee with me, and really look at it from the reader's point of view. Look at it with fresh eyes. Not only am I able to pinpoint some of the problems and mistakes and gremlins that get through, but I'm also able to see new opportunities to strengthen the writing, ways to whack wordiness better or form a parallel path or tap into the power of three. So if you have the luxury of printing it out and taking your time to proofread it, those are the things you want to look for. As you do that, take off your writer's hat and consider your reader's viewpoint. Yes, you're changing hats. You're looking at it from the point of view of somebody in your target audience. So keep that in mind as you're rereading it. Also, we want to match the word to the meaning. Now, for Two decades or more, I've been on a rampage to help to curb the use and misuse of words. Uh, as I trip over all sorts of gremlins, gremlins and glitches, I can't even say it right, all the gremlins that get through in writing, I've created what I call a word tripper. A word tripper looks like this. I'm comparing two uh, words that get mixed up all the time, like number and an amount. So here's a word tripper I came up with. You've likely heard people say, consider the amount of stores or the amount of muffins. Not correct. In these phrases, the word number should be used instead of amount. So how do you remember that? If you could quantify or count the objects, you use number. 
So therefore you would say, consider the number of stores or the number of muffins. We often hear people say the amount of dollars circulating. Not correct. We can count dollars. We would say the number of dollars, but we would also say the amount of money. There's a word tripper that's commonly misused. How about convince and persuade? This one's a little more subtle. You convince someone of an idea, but persuade them to take action. So you haven't really persuaded them until they've actually taken action. It's correct to say he convinced me it would taste good, but it's incorrect to say he convinced me to taste it. Instead, we would say he persuaded me to taste it. He's taken action. You've succeeded in the persuasion. Subtle, but there. How about advice and advise? Advice is a noun and it an advise is a verb. The advice you receive is only as good as the people who advise you. So here's the hint to remember the difference. Think of the word ice, I-C-E, which is a thing, a noun, and not an action. So the word I-C-E corresponds with the word advice, which is used as a noun. I'm full of tricks like this, and so is the Word Tripper book. So uh, uh, I also want to point out one of the most common ones. And this, again, is related to the American style, more so than the Brits or the Canadians. Um, that and which. You would use that when the phrase that follows is essential to the meaning of the sentence. For example, we provide guides that serve as an alternative to our programs. You would use which when the phrase gives information but isn't critical to the situation, to the understanding of the sentence. For example, the self-teaching guides, comma, which complement services we offer, comma, provide an alternative to our programs. In fact, it's a situation where we could drop out the which phrase and it would still make sense. The self-teaching guides provide an alternative to our programs. So always, as you notice, we use a comma before which, but we don't use a comma before that. It's a hard one to remember, but this is the way it is in correct American style English. So Let's do a quick review. And here's what I recommend, that you whack wordiness often so that your sentences are concise and as clear as possible. You want to set your objectives before you write so what you put down in paper you've already thought through. And what is down in paper, you can write it faster because you have thought through all the elements, the who, what, where, when, why, and how you're coming across as you intended. Also, you want to pursue a par parallel path so you can create a rhythm and a cadence in your writing. It's not jarring for people. It just seems to fit and follow that path. You want to tap into the power of three frequently. Our society loves it, so take advantage of it. Threes are more memorable than fours and fives and sixes, so tap into the quality of three. Also, you want to punctuate and proofread with fresh eyes and make word trippers your best friend. And I say that because I have created a word trippers book that I recommend highly. So, just a little bit more about me. I have an editorial service. I edit nonfiction books. I run workshops to help people write better. And I have a monthly e-zine called Add Power to Your Pen. I'm happy to subscribe you if you just send me an email. I also have created Word Tripper tips that go along with the Word Tripper books. You would receive a Word Tripper of the Week for 52 weeks. 300 plus word trippers in an ebook, writing bonuses, crossword puzzles, and a whole lot more. So go to wordtrippers.com to find out more about that. Just to wrap this up, I want to say 
thank you very much. I really had a blast. I enjoyed working with you on this. And feel free to contact me anytime, editor at barbaramcnichol.com. And I'd be happy to answer your questions on how to write better. Thank you.